So thank you, Mike, for joining us today. We'll talk about the Big City Flood Information System. It's actually a pretty cool tool that we get to use here locally, and it's, it's online, and anybody can go to it. So it'll be a fun little talk to have Mike finish with Ken Browns. Originally from Beatrice, Nebraska, attended the college of Arnie State College, obtained a BS degree in meteorology from the University of Kansas, then attended graduate school at Texas Tech University, and worked for weather data, which is on Wichita, Kansas, and we're joining the National, National Weather Service at the Portland Game in 1991. He eventually transferred to the Love, Texas office from 1991 to 1994. Sioux Falls in 1994, he's been here in Sioux Falls as the Senior Service Hydrologist and Finishings. So, help me welcome Mike Lisby. Good afternoon. Uh, everybody hear me all right? Yeah, I, I never, again, most people don't ever have an issue with me talking too softly. So uh, uh, hopefully this is working out all right. I uh, appreciate you having me here. Uh, the Big Sioux Flood Information System uh, came online in 2018, 2019. It's been around for a couple of years now. Uh, it was developed after all of the flooding that we saw back in 2010, 11, 14, 15, 18, 19. We just had so many years of flooding that multiple agencies from local governments, counties, state, all the way up to federal, as well as our friends from Respec uh, did a lot of the modeling that uh, came up with the inundation maps that we're gonna be looking at here. Um, the Iowa Flood Center uh, has a very similar system. In fact, this was based off of the Iowa Flood Center, though at least the interface part of it was. Uh, it's very easy to use, and we're going to kind of walk through a little bit here and uh, take a look at the Big Sioux Flood Information System. So, yeah, there's uh, multiple agencies uh, that come together from Again, local cities, counties, all the way up to the federal government, the core National Weather Service, and the USGS. And we now have over 50 river gauges in the Big Sioux Basin that we are monitoring in real time. And all of that data is uh, on this website. This kind of shows uh, Big Sioux River again starts up north of Watertown up there uh, near the Florence, goes through the Watertown area, Brookings, Del Rapids, Flandreau, uh, Sioux Falls, and then down to Sioux City. So uh, it also includes, uh, we've got gauges over in Minnesota and Iowa, the Rock River affects area down towards Sioux City. Uh, Pipestone, Split Rock Creek come out of southwest Minnesota. So uh, multiple states as well as multiple uh, federal and local agencies are all involved in this. So what you're going to find on the website is observed and forecast precipitation information uh, coming from the National Weather Service, as well as observed and forecast river stages uh, that is some from the USGS uh, and all of the different agencies, all of that data is in one place here. Uh, any active flood warnings or advisories that have been issued by the National Weather Service will be accessible on here in the video. Uh, and the thing that we're really going to focus on is uh, flood inundation. There are multiple scenarios that have been mapped out uh, for several communities along the Big Sioux Basin from Watertown, Brookings, Del Rapids, Sioux Falls, and Sioux City. Those are the main communities along the river that actually are impacted by flooding. Uh, there are other places, obviously, but uh, wanted to get the bang for the bucks and we pick the bigger communities that have the, the biggest impacts. So we're going to actually go to the site. And if anybody wants to access this site up on top, Big Sioux FIS dot org. That's all you need to remember. Big Sioux Flood Information System FIS dot org. 
and that will take you uh, right where you need to go to get all of the information for what's happening along the Big Sioux. And we'll see how the internet's working here. It's loading on the internet, wasn't it? There you go. There you oh, there go. You go. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you. You betcha. Okay, so when you launch the BigSueFIS.org, this is what you're going to come to. Uh, kind of a not a, the greatest map in the world uh, to start with. A little zoomed out. A couple of clicks on there. Um, one other thing I like to do is over on the left side here, uh, change the background image, uh, just like any other Google GIS map type thing that you're dealing with. And over here on the right, you have options uh, to show any flood warnings or alerts. To show the stream gauges is the second one that has the little radar looking thing there. And if you turn those on, it will bring up all of the river gauges as, as we showed before. Uh, again, the blue ones are, or no, the yellow ones are the USGS gauges, and the blue ones are primarily run by South Dakota DA and R. And if you want to see what's happening at any one of those gauges, again, basically you just click on it. And we'll zoom in a couple more here, kind of get to the Sioux Falls area. All right, so now you can see, uh, we'll look at, uh, This is the, then, here we go, the river gauge at North Cliff Avenue here. You click on it, it brings up a little map that shows what the river levels are. Uh, if there are four pads, rivers have been pretty flat, obviously that's what we're having here. Um, you know, I was talking earlier with, the, with one of the guys, you know, we had the 2018 and 2019 floods were a couple of the record floods in the Big Sioux Basin. And luckily when COVID hit and everybody got put down in their basement to do telework, we started a two year drought. So we haven't had to deal with any flooding for a couple of years, uh, which has been kind of nice. But uh, if there were any warnings or forecasts that would show up on here and uh, you'd be able to see what the forecast for the river is. And we'll close that and we'll get into the flood inundation maps. So the icon over on the left looks like the house is flooding. Obviously that is telling you flooding. And it shows you here the communities again that we have the flood inundation scenarios for. And if we click on Sioux Falls, it will zoom you into that level. And eventually, well, it's kind of tough to see, but uh, we're starting out with the base geometry, the no event steady flow, it also has the Skunk Creek flow. Obviously, if you're from around the Sioux Falls area, you know that not only does the water from the Big Sioux come in and cause issues, we have to watch Skunk Creek coming in from the west side of town and what that does around the south side of town. Uh, you can see a little bit of, let me get the pointer here so I can show you where I'm. The park system down around the south, even if it's 5,000, Cubic feet per second CFS flow on the skunk trees is going to cause some flooding along the parks down on the south side of town. Yankee uh, Trail, South Hill, Sherman Park, good and everything down through there. You can see that even with no water coming from the big, big Sioux, if you get 5,000 CFS on the skunk trees, you're going to have some flooding around the southeast side of town here. 
Now, what's nice about this is you there are different scenarios you can look at. So one that we will take a quick look at just to kind of show things. Uh, well, 1969 flood was a pretty big one in, in the Sioux Falls uh, around the Big Sioux River. So we're going to put in uh, 42,000 CFS on the Big Sioux. And you can see what will happen. 42,000 CFS, which is about what we had back in 1969, was the, the record flow. Uh, see areas north of 90 here really starting flooding. But we also have some areas around town uh, that will be impacted uh, up in the industrial area, out by the airport, um, some of those areas like that will be impacted. We're still not seeing a whole lot around the south side of town, but what we'll do is we will bump up the Skunk Creek flow to 15,000, which is about, that's a little bit over what the record flow is on Skunk Creek. I think it's like 1,000 correct. But now you can also see flooding down here along the west side of town, then to Skunk Creek, and then you've also got uh, the areas here from, again, Yang Trail Park all the way around through Falls Park uh, as an instance. The airport right here, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit better on that. So you can see that if we had record flooding on the Big Sioux. Uh, Skunk Creek obviously is not going to affect the airport, but as things sit right now, the best guess with the latest modeling we have is that there's gonna be a lot of things flooded out by the airport if we have a, a, another situation like 1969. Uh, this is Minnesota Avenue right here, uh, running by the airport. Industrial area here is uh, Falls Park. North of this Cliff Avenue here, areas just downstream uh, of the diversion. This is the diversion channel right here. Runs uh, along Minnesota Avenue. And that's the other thing that we can get into, into looking at is, I don't know if anybody was around back in 1997 when we had a record, uh, at the time it was near record flood or anticipated to be near record flood. And uh, we had the Corps of Engineers in town working with us at the Weather Service, and we trying to put out forecast working with the city, county, and state. And uh, we had a governor at the time that was very excitable. And, uh, he talked about blowing the levees north of town here to change how the flooding would work. Well, that is in the city's flood plan, that if things get to a certain level, they have the ability to basically blow the levees and pick which way the floods are gonna go. So just to show you what would happen, We'll zoom back out just a little bit here so we can see the whole city. And this is where the geometry section comes into play. This uh, southwest of the confluence dam, that is for the Skunk Creek area down here. New, new dam that we put in. Uh, to, I guess it's been probably seven, eight years now uh, since it was started. Uh, that would affect what floods down here, uh, kind of around uh, 26th and Louise area down to that area, back by the uh, confluence dam. And when they talk about the di diversion dam, that's the one up on uh, 60th Street North, right north of the airport. And one of the options, do a lighting breach west of the diversion dam. So if we select that option, it 
we can see how the flooding changes. The airport now does not flood very much. But look at all the flooding along the west part of town now. So if either on purpose or accidental levee failure on the west side of the diversion dam uh, will definitely change what parts of town are impacted by flooding as we get to the particularly these, these very high and reverend levels. And I'll zoom in a little bit here as well, too, in a minute. But um, where did I, there it is. The other option is a levee breach to the airport, which would be more on the east side of the diversion. And if we select that, again, you can see what happens, how the change, how the flooding flooded area changes. Instead of being a flood over on the west side, that is the airport, or into the central part of the town, I guess, and uh, water 12 trees uh, down around the Sioux, uh, those areas would be flooded. And if we zoom in a couple, Yeah, you can keep zooming in on this. And it shows every street, every house that's in the Google Map area that we see here, and show where that water is going to extend to. So if you live or work up in this area here, and you want to know is my house in threat and potentially going to be flooded if we have a record a 1969 type flood, you can come in here. Set these uh, flows to what they are. Look at the different types of scenarios and determine is my house going to flood? If you get down to each individual house level, if you just keep zooming in far enough. And I'll switch back now to the. We just go with the base and no uh, levy issues. Again, you see this part of town, doesn't really matter you know, whether that levy breach east of the airport or just the base flow with no levy issues. You're going to have some flooding through basically the central or west central part of town. Uh, in that area. Uh, so again, you can see down to the individual house where that water is going to be. And again, if we change the to the levee breach on the west side, again, this area of town doesn't change a lot. So it doesn't matter what scenario you're looking at if you're in this part of town. Uh, if you get an air record flood, 1969 type flood, we're going to have water through those areas. Now, this is all based off the best modeling that we could come up with. Uh, is it? You look at it and say, oh, the water is going to be two houses away from me. I'm fine. Probably don't want to take that chance if we start looking at those kind of uh, issues. Uh, also, if you're two houses into the flooded area, maybe you won't have an issue. The, the modeling is done the best that it can be. Every flood is different. You know, how fast the water comes in, where water seeps out, through levees, around levees. Uh, different roads. Uh, everybody remembers March of 2019, where we had ice that was about this thick, flowing down Skunk Creek and clogging up everything over on the west side. That kind of stuff is not really factored into the model. Uh, it can't be. 
too many factors. This is the best information we can come up with, but it gives you a general idea. And again, you can look at this kind of flood inundation uh, information for uh, Brookings along Six Mile Creek. Uh, Del Rapids has that information as well too. Uh, Watertown obviously is one of the areas that is always concerned with the lakes up there. Uh, they have that as an additional impact, Lake Campesco, Lake Pelican, uh, that can cause issues up there. And then you get down to Sioux City, uh, North Sioux City, Dakota Dunes. Obviously, they have the Missouri River as well. That is one thing that will be added to this. Uh, Tim Kalman told me a little while ago that that is going to be added, and our friends from Respect are working on that as well. That the flood inundation mapping for the Missouri River from Yankton down to uh, Dakota Dunes, Sioux City area, is going to be added to this system as well, too. So we'll be able to look at the Missouri River as well as the Big Sioux. So anybody that has any Christian friends or down in Sioux City, North Sioux City, Dakota Dunes area, these kind of inundation maps are going to be available for you as well, too. So there are lots of information on here. Um, just really just kind of touched on some of the basics here, but I, I encourage you to go around, go, go to the website, bigsuefis.org, play around with things. Uh, just look at the different scenarios. What, find out where, if you live near the river and you have an issue with flooding, find out what kind of flow. You know, is it gonna be 4,200? Or, you know, if we really wanna get biblical, um, as far as flooding goes, something that hasn't happened before but has been modeled, we can go all the way up to 65,000 CFS. And you can see, in, again, in just this area, it doesn't really do a whole lot different. Um, but if we zoom out, hopefully, there we go. City of Sioux Falls will get kind of cut off. We'll be an island if we never see 65,000 CFS coming down to Sioux. Uh, everything up by the airport is all going to be closed off. The interstate, I-90 up there, flooded. Here's the which back in 2019 did flood and was closed. Twelve, twelve trees down the street through here. Going to be flooded. Uh, I want to find, I believe, also underwater place over here. Flooded. If we ever get up to that kind of level, so play around. Take a look at things. You can't hurt anything. These are all basically static images that have been generated from our, from the modeling at these different flows. Uh, we can't put in, oh, we know exactly the forecast is going to be 18,000 CFS coming down. What's it going to do? Well, if that's not one of the options, we don't have that information here, but uh, all of the rest will be more significant floods and potential floods. Again, 65,000 is, you know, 80% above what our record is, but can it happen? Who knows? Possibly. So, uh, anybody have any questions? That's all I've got here for uh, my presentation. Anybody have any questions? Yes. There, there is some talk about adding uh, potentially like uh, Trent, Flandreau, uh, Castlewood, some of these smaller communities. Um, that, that there is some talk about adding those. I don't know. I'm sure it's a time and funding issue. Uh, it takes takes a lot of time and work to run through all these scenarios and, and model them uh, properly. So, but there is talk of that. Um, the system itself actually will show uh, some of the gauges in the, in the Vermilion Basin and the James Basin, I believe, as well. But flooding out there doesn't usually impact any community, so there's probably not going to be a whole lot of work there. It's going to stay primarily focused along the Big Sioux, and of course the Missouri as that expands. Anything else? All right, thanks for having me.
Well, all righty, I think we might be a small group to do this last kickoff. This last this last session, I was I was competing with um with Holly and her sustainability and climate action plan. So should have uh, should have thought that I might have a small small gaggle with me today. But you guys get to learn a little bit about what I do. Uh, sorry, Jay Gilbertson couldn't make it today. Uh, this would have been a state of the Big Sioux River water quality kind of talk. Um, but he had some issues he was attending to family wise and he just couldn't make the time today. So uh, I get to fill your ears uh, about what the city of Sioux Falls does as far as our MS4 permit, what an MS4 permit is, um, why we do what we do and why I get to do what I do. So the permit itself, an MS4 permit is a municipal separate storm sewer system permit. An MS4 is basically any stormwater conveyance in the city of Sioux Falls that is city of Sioux Falls property. So any of the storm sewers, any of the storm drainage channels, any of our stormwater ponds, all of that that city of Sioux Falls owned and operated and maintained is part of our MS4 system. Um, and we have to regulate that for the permit that we have through the state of South Dakota. Uh, the main goal that we like to use in regulatory kind of jargon is MEP, the maximum extent practicable. So uh, when we're talking about goals and an MS4 permit, there's not really hard set goals. They're kind of soft goals. They're not, you know, you're gonna have stormwater leaving an outfall on the levee at this number. It's just, you gotta do a certain set of things to make sure that you're proving that you're doing the best that you can to reduce your impact to stormwater into the Big Sioux River here locally. There's six main parts of the permit. I'll run through them quick because we're going to run through them in a little bit more detail. You got construction sites, you got wet weather monitoring, you got illicit discharge management, commercial residential program, public education and outreach, which is what we're doing today, um, municipal facility runoff control programs, and industrial facilities programs. So those all wrapped in that six plus monitoring. The monitoring doesn't count as one of those main parts, but we do have to do it every year. Uh, construction site management, procedures for site planning and approval. You got to address structural and non-structural BMPs on construction sites, uh, procedures that are needed for site inspection and enforcement, and uh, training for construction site operators, which is something we did this morning. Uh, we put on a training this morning for construction site operators, designers, and developers um, to, to meet that requirement. So the construction site program, there's a lot on the screen here, but um, there's a site planning component to it. So every development that has that comes through the city of Sioux Falls engineering division uh, goes through a thorough review that also includes making sure that they have a stormwater pollution prevention plan. Uh, basically, they have BMPs in place that are adequate that will, you know, that have been proven in practice to treat stormwater to a certain level um, that is acceptable. And uh, typically we have, uh, you know, codes that protect this review uh, that, that are in our building code and actually a special subdivision code in the city of Sioux Falls um, code of ordinances. And uh, my job is basically predicated on what we call the EDS and uh, engineering design standards, chapters 11 and 12 there. That's, that's my whole life in a nutshell, day in and day out here for the city. Uh, just running around town, making sure the contractors are following the standards uh, within chapters 11 and 12, and chapter 12 primarily. Um, we have to address the structural and non-structural BMPs. So again, it's heavy reliance on chapter 12, and that's full of, if you guys drive around town and you see the black fence, that's silt fence, um, there might be sediment basins, you might see ponds, um, anything like that. Sometimes there's wattles, those straw wattles, you see those. Um, and sometimes it looks like there's nothing when there's something, just because Sometimes they divert water all to a common point to a pond. So just because you don't see those things that are easy to notice doesn't mean that there isn't a plan. Um, uh, it just depends on the site. So the, the but they address that in that BMP portion. And a uh, site inspection and enforcement is is about what we do here. We have priorities. Um, you know we have sites in Sioux Falls that are a quarter of an acre or less, all the way up to our wonderful foundation park that just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing as we talk. So um, you're talking from one acre to hundreds of acres. They all have their different requirements. They all have their different challenges. 
Um, and we have uh, inspection and enforcement priorities based on the size of a site. Uh, sometimes we go monthly, sometimes we go more frequently, and sometimes we only go when there's a complaint. It just depends on the size of the site and where it's at. So we do have code that protects that kind of work. Um, we have chapter 40 city Sioux falls code that actually allows us to enforce our stormwater standards, much like a cop kind of enforces traffic codes. Um, we get the joy of working with contractors and developers and and kind of uh, almost writing them tickets like a traffic cop would. Uh, we don't like doing it. Uh, we try to avoid doing it, um, but we do have that in place just in case someone's not listening or they're getting a little wily and and they're not treating the water before it leaves their site or they're or they're causing issues downstream. And then again, the training we put on a training this morning. We try to put out regular correspondence for the contractor community here in Sioux Falls just to to make them more aware of. Um, of what goes on in the MS4 program and make them aware of their impact. So construction site program implementation in a nutshell uh, kind of looks like this. Um, you got your pretty, you got your pretty plans at the outset, but then sometimes there's always something that you forget. And um, you know you have this this area is actually a privately owned pond and um, the developer here didn't really plan for what was going to happen when stormwater ran off from this area. So we were having an issue there and we had to have them slap some silt fence in the field. So that was actually catching flows before it got onto someone else's private property. So that in a nutshell, that's what we do with the construction site program. We have the SWIP, which is here, and these aren't the same sites, but it's just a good example of you have your SWIP that has controls. And then you have to you have to always translate that into the field and adjust as necessary. So that's what we do. Uh, wet weather monitoring. Um, in a nutshell, we have three sites that we do along the river in Skunk Creek every year, twice a year during a qualified rain event, which is a tenth of an inch of rain in two hours to sleep. Uh, we have upstream here at I-90, upstream at Skunk Creek, and then the downstream. Set the downstream of our wastewater treatment facility. Um, it gives us a snapshot of what's coming into town and then what's going out of town. And we have to do that. Uh, legally, we are required to do that twice a year at least. Um, and then uh, the table, I don't know if you guys can read it really well, but there's a, there's a whole slew of conventional uh, chemicals and analyses that we have to, we have to be tracking. Their sample um, anywhere from six hours to 12 hours, depending on how much rain we're going to get, um, how long it seems like it's going to be forecasted for in the whole nine. So um, minimum, it has to be at least a three hour sampling event. So, and another component is we actually have to sample BMPs and outfalls throughout town. So we focus in some common areas throughout the history of this program. We kind of, we have different areas. Now you can see we have low. We've tried to update this map, but um, you know, we, we have some flexibility here. At the end of the day, we have to sample one outfall, wherever that is. We have we have to sample uh, BMP for its efficacy. So we have to sample the upstream end and the downstream end of a BMP, a pond, what have you, in town. So if you're ever driving around and you see a random white little white box trailer sitting somewhere with a little solar panel on it, it's probably us trying to keep track of uh, what's getting into that BMP or what's leaving a certain amount of residential. So, um, you know, long story short, we have this commercial area. We actually don't have the outfall on this map, but there's an outfall by the PetSmart off of Louise Avenue that we, we sample. There's a commercial outfall. We have an industrial outfall up here on the north side of town, um, up in this area, I believe. Oh, no, it's up uh, on Benson Road going to the airport. And then we have BMPs and industrial BMP, and then we focused heavily on the west side for residential type of BMPs. So um, again, this is something that we do every year, at least twice a year. So we do have four um, required sampling events when we're having it rain. And unfortunately for us, it's usually in the dead of night and we have to get out there and we have to make sure everything's working and take our grab samples as well. So it uh, can be a joy come day. We have our illicit discharge management program, and it, it encompasses prevention of illicit discharges and improper proper disposal, 
uh, ongoing outfall screening, uh, which is different than the wet weather screening, um, investigation of any reported suspected illicit discharges, control of sanitary sewer seepages, response to toxic substance spills, and then a public education program about illicit discharges and what is allowed and not allowed to be discharged into the storm sewers and sewer. So, in a nutshell, we have some wonderful pictures here that all considered illicit discharges. Um, this one's just sand that a landscaping company left on the road before a rainstorm, got into the inlet, plugged the inlet up, backed up water. So uh, they had to they had to be enforced for an illicit discharge. A lot of times folks think of illicit discharges along the lines of what these bad boys are when we have oil, when we have an oil spill or something like that that happens and, and unfortunately gets into our waterways. Um, we have to respond to those. We have uh, the support of our um, hazmat team at the fire rescue here in Sioux Falls, and they do a wonderful job. Uh, so they assist us whenever issues like this come up. And um, we have to do our best to make sure that we mitigate any kind of spills of anything that could impact stormwater negatively here in Sioux Falls. So uh, the out the outfall screening is another big important component to our list illicit discharge program. Basically, every three years, this is a goal of ours. We could do it every five. But at the city of Sioux Falls, we like to we like to see if we can do more. So every three years, we get our eyes on every single outfall from the city of Sioux Falls that that discharges into Skunk Creek and the Big Sioux. At least at least one time a year for three years, we get to every, get to every outfall and see if there's a flow. Is it suspicious? What's things looking like in the area? Do we need to investigate this further? That kind of thing. Um, and then sanitary sewer seepage is luckily for us handled a lot by our sanitary sewer team. Uh, they do see regular um, CCTV inspections of sanitary sewers here in Sioux Falls. If they ever find a problem, they let us know and we work with them on rectifying the situation so that it's not impacting any groundwater or stormwater resources in the nearby area. Um, and then public education is, is, a, is a big deal. And actually we do a lot of that through our, our education for the hazardous household waste facility that we have um, that we have here in Sioux Falls that we're all lucky to be able to enjoy that service. So um, that is just a good way to remind people you can't dump it anywhere. It's got to go somewhere that it can be handled correctly. We have a commercial residential program. Um, basically what this is, is it's all these things that the city does that folks probably don't realize we do day in and day out. Uh, we do maintenance of our structural controls, our ponds, our drainage ways, our stormwater, everything like that. Um, planning procedures, our plan review procedures when a development wants to come online that's new. Um, and then we, as a city, we are required to assess ponds that have been built and, um, and plan, for future, plan for the future as well, as far as our, our, um, our best management practices and how to best utilize them to increase water quality within Sioux Falls. And then we also have to make sure that we're keeping as a city, this isn't, this doesn't include residents. It is just city usage. So our, our own facilities, our own people, you know, whether that's parks and rec or whether that's the guys that maintain our drainage ways, uh, we have to make sure that we're tracking our chemical usage, our fertilizer and pesticide. So here's a lovely picture of uh, some of my favorite guys that work for the city of Sioux Falls. If you ever see these big yellow trucks, give them a honk and a wave because these guys do a lot of hard work and they're pretty awesome. Um, basically, they meet the maintenance of structural controls portion for us. Um, every year they set a goal to clean and jet and inspect at least 25%, if not 30% of the storm sewer system in Sioux Falls. Um, and they do a good job of meeting that goal, but the guys are working nonstop just to meet that goal. And that's only 25 to 30% of the system. As you can imagine, we don't have just problems in just the 25 to 30% of the system. Um, new development planning procedures. Uh, that's just basically we have a bunch of administrative controls set in place, whether that's engineering design standards or city code. Um, that if you don't meet those certain parameters, then our plan reviewers and our engineering department are not going to green light your development until you do. Uh, public street and highway maintenance. Um, we actually have to monitor how much ice, ice melt and sand we put out on the road, how much salt and sand we put out on the road. And again, um, any, any kind of turf management we do along the public right away, we need to monitor. And this is where when you see the street sweepers, that's why you see them. 
You know, some people think it's because we want to keep the city clean, and we do. But we're regulatorily required to be sweeping the streets three times a year. So that's what we're doing out there. We're getting those guys out there to make sure that they're cleaning the roads thoroughly. So every mile of Sioux Falls is swept three times a year uh, due to our commercial and residential program. And then these bottom bullets here, again, general pesticide and herbicide, just kind of keep keeping track of that, seeing if there's any impact of our usage of chemicals along drainage ways and then parks and that kind of thing. If there's ever any kind of correlation that we can draw between that and any kind of weird numbers we're getting on the river. So, so far, so good though. I can tell you that here in Sioux Falls. And, um, and we're always looking at better ways to to uh, do our best management practices at the city of Sioux Falls. We do think forward. We do try to implement regional stormwater basins to help our development expand. Um, and with that, we try to always rethink the wheel every now and then to see if we're getting getting the best, making the best impact on water quality when we're putting in these projects. Public education. Well, folks, this is a big one for us. This summit today is a big is a big push for us. A public education program, and uh, all in all, it's just basically we need to make sure that we are doing our due diligence to make the public aware of what the MS4 is, make the public aware that we are regulated through the state of South Dakota, that there are things that cannot be put down the storm drain, and um, and do our best to come up with campaigns, come up with ways to share that information, and um, and and just help, help, hopefully help the public help us. In a, in a nutshell. Again, you know, we have a hazardous household waste program, which people love to use, and we love to see that because that keeps a whole slew of chemicals out of the storm sewer conveyance system. And uh, with that, it also comes with an education piece of, okay, this stuff cannot go down into the storm sewer. Um, and then we have we have markers, we have inlet markers we do every year. We do hundreds of inlet markers in neighborhoods every year to remind residents. And we do cleanups. Uh, big, another big one is our cleanups we do every year. We, the floods kind of impacted that work, but we're back at it. We're doing the river greenway cleanup again, and, and folks have been helping us with that. Uh, and there, I, we have a couple of websites that we try to keep updated the best we can that have some good information for folks. SiouxFalls.org slash green is in our environmental page. And SiouxFalls.org public work storm drainage is where all the fun technical mumbo jumbo for storm water is kept. Our MFRCP uh, is just a municipal facility. So our streets campus, our, um, our vehicle maintenance facilities and those kind of places, um, they have to have a plan. We have to have a plan in place that has best management practices just to make sure that we're not um, unduly impacting our stormwater conveyance system. And uh, really that's the that's the nuts and bolts of it. If you wanna know, I have a list of the facilities we have there. Landfill and water rec are left off because um, they actually have their own stormwater permits through the state of South Dakota. They're industrial facilities, so they actually have their own permits and, and uh, they're not really lumped in with our MS4. They have their own stuff they have to do. Uh, we sure help those folks out, the fine folks at Water Rec and at the landfill, but um, they have their own requirements to meet. And then the last one that I'll beat you over the head about is the industrial facilities program. And at the end of the day, this one's probably the least hashed out one we have. Uh, we have a 20 year old permit that's never been reviewed yet uh, or renewed yet. So um, the industrial facilities program is basically just how do we assist the industry in Sioux Falls to make sure that there is a general compliance with the state of South Dakota industrial stormwater uh, permit? Holes, are there any gaps? Are there any problems that we need to work with the state and with the certain stakeholder on to make sure that they're meeting those permits? So we do have an inventory um, called the Industrial Waste Survey. And like I said, we keep track of any facilities that do have permits through the state of South Dakota. Uh, we send surveys out on a regular basis. And we keep an eye on any significant industrial users. We have about 18 of those in town that um, have permits and have an impact to the local water resources. And we also keep track of what we call liquid waste generators. Some of those guys don't really matter as far as storm water, but some do. So we make sure to 
check up on those folks every now and then too. And, um, a lot of times uh, we follow up on complaints or when we're inspecting the system during those dry weather periods, if we see issues, we'll take those up. And a lot of times we'll follow those up the stream until we might find an industrial source. And we have had that happen in the last few years where we found some, some suspect discharges that we traced all the way back to an industrial user and had to go through uh, the process of making sure that they came back into compliance uh, with their existing industrial stormwater permit. So um, with that, Hopefully I, hopefully I kept the time up pretty good there, but um, just wanted you guys to know that the city of Sioux Falls does have quite a robust program in place um, to try to do its due diligence as far as stormwater and, and, and urban runoff. If we could do more, we could, but a lot of times, you know, you go to leadership and the biggest thing is, oh, well, that's going to take too much time and money, so we're going to keep it. Focusing on that MEP. Are we meeting that MEP? Yes. Okay. Well, keep doing your thing. And we'll revisit it next year. So, um, if you ever have questions about what's going on in the city, if you ever have questions about a development, you think that there's something going on in a certain area of town, don't understand why certain contractors aren't doing enough, or you think they're not doing enough, you can always reach out. My email's there. I'll go to our website. Lots of people like that with me, but our office follows up on any of those and we always are regularly inspecting construction on a monthly basis. So yeah, got any questions? I think we got a little bit of time. Colin, what do you think is the biggest opportunity for improvements for the city? Yeah, you know, we have a pretty robust construction site program. I didn't go into the nitty gritty of it for you guys, just on, just because of uh, time, for the sake of time. But um, that we really, really hashed out. The development communities worked on it with us, worked on our design standards. I've been told by out of town contractors that we have pretty robust standards compared to other cities. The difference is other cities have more hardcore administrative controls than we do. So we've focused on the design standards, whereas other cities, they've updated their permits. They've kind of changed their rules around a little bit. So we've kept old rules and just updated our standards and made things work in the field. There's kind of a difference there. So um, as far as improvement, it's just, are we doing enough with our BMPs in town? You know, a lot of times it's a struggle of working with our engineers and our stormwater drainage team uh, where they just want detention they just want to hold the water for a certain period of time, let it go. They don't really care about the water quality aspect of it. They care about the hydrologic aspect of it, and that's it. Uh, for me, I'm always trying to hammer them over the head about little ideas that they could sprinkle in that uh, might actually increase the water quality before it, it leaves the need to fall. And there are a lot of times where uh, detention-focused DMPs have done a good job of increasing water quality too. But unfortunately, uh, that pesky bacteria <laughs> that we deal with here in this basin that doesn't seem to really want to come out of the water in those those type of ponds. So thinking about ways that we can address that is, is probably the biggest biggest item on the list. Why not? Oh. What sort of thing is there available for bacteria that Right. Right. If you had, you know, if you had robust plant life and like a wetland um, that had good drainage, you know, what we've learned is that you can't just let it sit in a wetland or it just kind of stews and, and then you just have bacteria come and propagate again anyway. Um, so, you know, holding times matter big time. Um, we're actually hoping that we can work with Dr. Hua and his team on a simple solution uh, to use a steel byproduct or a, or a waste product from, from a steel to just straight up kill the bacteria flowing through drainages. We want to see if that works. Um, there's been promising research and I won't go into it because we're going to have an awesome talk by Dr. Hua. You know, so we're really looking forward to seeing something like that as a possibility because at this point, you know, that pesky bacteria is just, there's no real cost effective way to deal with it. So. Scalable. Yeah, on an industrial scale, of, of course, it absolutely is. Um, when you're talking about UV light, when you know you got to think of it in the aspect of 
you could probably try it in like a storm sewer right underneath the ground. Um, the kickback you always get from folks is what's that maintenance going to look like? You know, how long is that really going to last? If we have high flows, if we have floods, that kind of thing, you know, when you have high solids, like we do in Sioux Falls, it's probably kind of a moon point. So it's a good idea in theory. It's just, um, when you hash it out, it's just not something that's really that easy. <laughs> No, that's actually a good question. So we do do other sampling. Uh, we we do voluntary sampling every week along. Actually, see if I can go back here. These guys. So this map is actually we take samples of each of these points every week um, throughout the year. Unless it's frozen, then we don't. Um, but yeah, so we have upstream, upstream, and then we have Falls Park, and we have. Two really old points, the traditional points where uh, Boston Bridge is upstream of our water rack facility, I think it's about right here. And then the timber line, it used to be the old timber line. We had to work with the DOT when they decided to destroy our little sampling on that old bridge there um, and, and get something figured out over there. That's our downstream. So we actually can see if there's any impact by the wastewater treatment. So we have that and we do that with. And that's a, that's just a separate thing that we chose to do as a city just to keep track of things. Yeah. If you have any other questions, I'll be wandering around the rest of the day, so you can always uh, bug me about the ins and outs of the MS4 permit and anything like that. You said that there's a separate MS4 for the city water Separate. Yeah, so we're the MS4, the city as you know, a municipality, we're the MS4, it's just all that conveys. Um, a landfill is technically seen as a industrial facility in the eyes of the EPA and the state. So they have an industrial storm water. And water reclamation has the same. If you, if you really wanted to do some fun dry reading, go and look at the industrial storm water a general permit on the EPA's website and see their breakout of all of the different facilities and subsects of those facilities. It's going to be quite interesting. Yeah, we do we do um, assist those teams at the landfill and water rec, but they're not necessarily tied into our own explorer system. Landfill, they impact Cherry Creek primarily. Their discharge goes to Cherry Creek, which does eventually get to Skunk Creek. In a roundabout way, um, but there you go. So they're kind of lucky in the fact that um, they're a little bit off the grid. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. First thing I want to do is is thank the the sponsors that have helped uh, help support us today. Um, East Dakota Water Development District, uh, the Friends of the Big Sioux River, Respec, Concrete Materials, ISG, and the Soil and Water Conservation Society. Uh, thanks for supporting us. We we appreciate your help and and keeping this thing going. Um, and along with that. Um, Encourage everybody who hasn't go get over to the soil and water conservation society's booth over there. They've got a raffle for a for a t shirt there. And so make sure to get your chance in. There's uh, some sort of guessing game over there on a quantity of something. And win yourself a free t shirt. Since you didn't want to bring it home, so let's let's get it uh, let's get it uh, given away. Next thing I want to do is is thank uh, Colin and Troy in my office. They uh, they were the ones who put in all the work to make this possible. So I want to say thank you to them for for all the efforts that uh, they did to to pull this together. And, and last thing, I want to thank all of you for for coming today. Um, you know, everybody's got full days, and we appreciate the time you're committing to uh, to uh, the efforts we're putting to clean up the Big Sioux River. Um, 
you know, it's a great natural feature that we have in both in, in Sioux Falls itself and just this east, eastern side of South Dakota. And it's something we want to continue to support and continue to, to make better. Um, you know, it's the effort of all of us together that's going to make that happen. The, the producers, the landowners, the, the developers, uh, and the government and citizens. So uh, the way we move forward is working together. So with that, uh, Mayor Paul Taken, Ten Aiken has uh, agreed to give us a few words, so I'll, I'll bring him up. All right, thanks, Josh. Josh was supposed to go to our city council meeting tonight, but he got out of it. So he's in a really great mood right now. So Josh, congratulations on that. Uh, I also want to thank Troy and Colin. Thanks for organizing this and, uh, and doing this every year. Um, you know, I know this is, I think, is this the 10th year? Ninth, ninth year. Um, and I think the topic probably gets more and more uh, important every year. We recently, with the with the help of Holly and with Chris in the back, Chris Wave, okay, we formed what we call the Mayor's Youth Council in the city um, for the first time, and it consists of about a dozen juniors and seniors from different high schools and uh, with school districts within the Sioux Falls city limits. Great bunch of kids, um, and. We've had, I don't know, two or three meetings with them uh, so far. And what's been interesting is we start to ask this group, what, what topics do they want to dive more into? What are things that are important to them? What are issues that are important to them? And we brought, the, we brought the mayor's youth council forward because a lot of times what happens in government is like, we have, we have an idea of something we want to do. Let's say we want to put a park across the street over there. Our parks department, maybe determines that's the right spot for it, that we then take it to the parks board, which consists of 40 to 60 year olds. And they say, sounds good. And then they take that to the city council, which consists of 40 to 60 year olds. And they say, all right, that sounds good. And then we put a park there and nowhere along the line, do we get the input of, you know, the, the young families that would maybe want to use the park? What sort of assets should we put there? So part of that mayor's youth council will be to get their input on, on things and, but when we started that, we asked them a couple issues that were important to them. And one of the most important issues to that generation is sustainability and community resiliency and climate change. And so as we look at building our city and building our community and building our region as a place where young people want to stay or move to or come back to, if they don't see a community that's investing in like taking care of assets that have been entrusted to them and doing um, real significant deliberate efforts towards taking care of those natural resources, they're not going to want to come. And that's everything from taking care of the water, things like the Big Sioux and the watershed and all the efforts of that to um, dealing with the impact of, of heat and our changing climate to uh, I think we're going to get our first electric vehicle in the city fleet. Uh, this year, we're going to pilot uh, EV and see how we can expand that within the city fleet. We got to keep looking at some of those sorts of initiatives and that shouldn't be. Unfortunately, it is sometimes shouldn't be political to talk about climate and climate change and so forth. But the data very much shows us otherwise. If you're a denier that the world is changing around us, the seasons are changing uh, and we have to be investing in uh, ways to combat some of that. So I want to thank, oh, by the way, the other piece, other than uh, sustainability uh, and climate change that that youth council is interested in. The second thing was youth mental health was another big topic to them. So just interesting to know kind of what's in the heads of our youth and what's important to them. So our climate and mental health. So it gives you an idea of some of the issues that we need to focus on as a city uh, and as a community. Um, you know, part of, uh, of this work is being led by uh, a woman that I know you've met already, Holly Meyer, who does our sustainability uh, efforts for the city. In fact, we're, uh, we're in the process of developing our sustainability and climate action plan uh, right now that's being led by, uh, by Holly. Um, 
and a lot of that is going to de be determined by, you know, what does the public want to see us working on? What do they feel will have the most impact? Uh, and this asset, specifically the Big Sioux River, is probably, not probably, it is the most valuable natural asset we have in this community. In between uh, starting this past fall, when we broke ground on the steel project at the, uh, the kind of low head dam of the Big Sioux River, Fast forward from then to the next five years, we will have over $500 million invested in projects along or within a nine iron of the Big Sioux River. And those investments probably don't happen without that river being there. Or if the river is an eyesore, or if the river has pollution issues, or if the river becomes not an asset, but a detriment, $500 million are not being invested there. And that's the Steel District project, that's Sharapa, uh, that's phase three of the River Greenway, which will be a reconstruction. Part of that will be reconstructing that low head dam that we have there to control the, uh, the water flow uh, of the river. Um, Jacobson Plaza is gonna be outdoor uh, refrigerated ice skating ribbon just north of the Levitt Falls, just along the, the north side, or excuse me, the uh, west side of the river there. So we have a real vested interest in Sioux Falls, as I know all your other communities do too, all the way up and down the watershed to um, make sure that we work together on taking care of this asset. I get asked fairly frequently about the, the Big Sioux River and initiatives that we're working on to ensure the cleanliness of the river. And I was telling the guys before came up here just that everyone wants the home run answer. Like what's, What's the one thing that we we're doing? Like, is it if we only had more buffer zones, or we only did, did you know didn't discharge into the river from you know any wastewater plants or anything like that? And everyone kind of has an answer, but I think it's it's just two degrees of change that we're continuing to make on different fronts, and it's also um, a high degree of focus on collaboration because this is Sioux Falls, this is Brookings, this is all the way up to Webster, uh, this is Madison. Every community up and down uh, that river along that watershed has a part to play in this. And so I want to thank you all for taking time to invest uh, your time into an initiative like this. And in fact, next year, uh, Holly, you don't know this yet, but I think we should expand this to be uh, focused on broader climate issues. I mean, the river is important, and, but if we had morning sessions about, you know, lead certification, green building tactics, some of our low impact zone development stuff we're doing in the city, other things that, you know, prevent runoff and so forth. I think there'd be um, an appetite for that. And I think would open up the audience of people that would also want to come to even people within the community that would have much more of an appetite to learn about what are some of the sustainability and resiliency initiatives happening across the region, not only about water, but about all aspects of the environment. So I'll just put that bug in your ear because I think there's an opportunity for this to grow and get more kind of intentional focus on the initiatives that I know are happening in the community. So, so thanks for letting me uh, uh, be here with you guys today. Uh, it is my pleasure though to, uh, to introduce uh, your keynote today. Uh, so Dr. Hua is currently an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at South Dakota State University. He received his PhD in civil engineering from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Prior to joining SDSU, he had six years of consulting experience in water and wastewater treatment, and his current research interests include drinking water treatment, disinfection byproducts, and storm water treatment. So I would uh, ask that you would help me welcome Dr. Hua to the stage, please. Well, thanks everybody for being here today uh, for the Big River uh, World Summit, and thanks for Connie and thanks for the Mayor for the introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, a project that we have been doing at SDSU uh, on stormwater treatment uh, using some of the cost-effective material, uh, including recycled steel uh, byproducts. And we know that uh, uh, during the rainfall events, uh, we can create some uh, stormwater uh, runoff. Unfortunately, uh, this runoff can collect some of the waste material uh, from uh, 
habitats, uh, landscaping, and some of the road uh, surface. And, uh, and those contaminants can cause some potential issues uh, in the surface water quality. And this figure shows the impact of the urbanization uh, on the stormwater runoff. Uh, our, na our natural landscape about um, 10 to 20 percent uh, only can be created runoff. Uh, the rest can be infiltrated uh, into the soil. So basically, under natural conditions, uh, we would have very small runoff, and most of what rainfall uh, will enter uh, the groundwater systems from the, uh, through the soil infiltration. So as we create an uh, impervious surface, uh, in that case, uh, more than 70% of the rainfall becomes the runoff. Eventually, uh, we'll pick up the contaminant uh, in the surface and enter the uh, waterways. So we know that it's necessary for us to continue to expand urbanization uh, and agriculture activity production uh, to support the population growth and the economic growth and uh, some other recreational activities. At the same time, uh, we also need to be concerned about our natural environment. Uh, we need to preserve our uh, surface water and other natural resources uh, such that we can have a certain, certain, uh, sustainable development uh, in the future. And there are several major uh, categories of different contaminant can be uh, present uh, in the surface water runoff, uh, such as suspended solids. Those are the particles uh, that are generated from road and the natural landscape. Uh, heavy metals, uh, typically copper and zinc from the tail gas from automobile. Uh, nutrients, uh, we discussed nutrients uh, in, pre in previous presentations, such as uh, phosphorus and nitrate. And this nutrient can promote algae growth uh, in lake and, and rivers. Uh, that can cause eutrophication uh, in lake and rivers. And also we could have pathogens uh, such as uh, uh, bacteria, uh, protozoa, uh, GRD, and crude sorbidium. And uh, many of the pathogens can cause some issues uh, during the recreational water use also injection. Uh, and also we could have oil and grease from the spill from different uh, sources. And lastly, we could have some organic chemicals such as uh, uh, pesticide and herbicide we use for uh, agriculture production and for lawn care. And there are many tools uh, we can use, like the state of Sioux Falls uh, utilize many of the tools uh, to control the storm water. Uh, we could have the uh, uh, detention pond and the detention uh, basin or dry pond. So basically during a uh, storm event, uh, this pond will hold the water and after the storm event, it will gradually discharge the water uh, to the receiving water body. So basically, the peak storm water can be controlled by this uh, uh, detention pond. And also, we could have some uh, permanent wet pond called the retention basin. So basically, for this type of basin, uh, we could have permanent uh, water body within the basin. And uh, during regular uh, non-rainfall seasons, evaporation will take place and reduce the water volume within the uh, retention basin. Uh, roadside, we could have infiltration basin. Uh, so basically we could put some soil and create a, a channel. The storm water can be infiltrated to the soil uh, and, and then groundwater system instead, instead of being the surface water runoff. And in recent years, uh, there's many low impact, low, uh, de uh, low impact development uh, such as the bar retention cell have been installed in many cities uh, and uh, other municipalities. Uh, so basically, we create a, a retention cell uh, with some uh, uh, soil support, uh, gravel support, and then we can grow some, uh, 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 some plants on top of that. And during the storm runoff event, uh, the rainwater can be captured by the plant. Uh, nutrient, uh, solid uh, can be picked up by the cell. And then uh, the treated work can either infiltrate uh, to the groundwater or uh, discharge to the surface after uh, treatment. So these are the many tools we can utilize uh, to help mitigate uh, the surface impact on the, uh, uh, the storm water impact on surface water bodies. 
And the, uh, the tool that I just discussed uh, can have very good impact on the volume uh, solid of the sun water runoff. But uh, many of the BMPs uh, that I just showed uh, have very limited impact on the bacterial concentrations. But basically, those, those BMPs uh, cannot retain a large quantity of bacteria uh, in the storm water runoff. And here, the focus of our project is on E. coli. And E. coli is used as an indicator uh, uh, microorganism. Uh, the meaning of indicator is that if we have E. coli uh, in our uh, surface water or some water, that can potentially indicate the fecal cont contamination, either from humans or, or from animals. And the fecal contamination can uh, include some of the more dangerous species, uh, such as Giardia and Cryptosporidium, that can have high impact uh, on the public health. Uh, e. coli is a group of uh, gram-negative uh, bacteria, uh, rod uh, shape, and this figure shows the typical uh, 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 shape of the E. coli species. Uh, most of the E. coli species are harmless. Actually, many of the E. coli species uh, are beneficial uh, for humans uh, because they can help the digestive system. But some of the species uh, can be toxic, such as uh, uh, O157 and H7. Uh, those species can produce a, a high, uh, strong toxin uh, in human bodies. So therefore, uh, if human uh, uh, in, uh, is in contact with, with some E. coli content water, uh, we could have some diarrhea and fever or some bacteria uh, infection. Uh, that can have significant impact on the public uh, health. So therefore, uh, E. coli uh, is a recommended for the regulation uh, for different uh, recreational water usage. And this table shows the EPA recommended standard uh, for the recreational water usage, such as swimming and other uh, 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 other purposes, uh, in generally depend on their uh, usage types, and we could have a different regulatory standard. Typically, uh, in order to, for the water quality to meet the recre recreational usage, the the average E. coli concentration should be somewhere around 100 to 126 uh, per 100 ml. Uh, the peak concentration should be somewhere around 320 to 400 uh, per 100 uh, ml. Uh, so these are the recommended standard uh, for different state and, and municipalities to use uh, to control their stone water quality. Here, let's talk about uh, South Dakota uh, as a state. Uh, where are we at regarding our surface water quality? And this figure is published by uh, South Dakota Department of Environment and uh, Water Resource and Natural Resources. Uh, and this figure uh, shows the uh, lakes and rivers, and the color indicated their current health, uh, state of health. Uh, if uh, if the color is blue, uh, that means uh, that water body uh, meets all the beneficial usage. And if the color is uh, uh, red, that means at least uh, that water body does not meet one of the uh, beneficial uses, such as swimming or other purposes. As you can see, 69.4% um, uh, of the stream uh, miles do not support one or more uh, beneficial uses. So we have some issues in the state uh, as a general uh, regarding the surface water quality. And the Big Tree River are uh, right here, as you can see. Many sections of Big Tree River are impaired uh, by two parameters, total suspended solid and E. coli. And E. coli is one of the major contaminants uh, in the Big Tree River. So we have the issue already, and we need to find ways and work as a group uh, to gradually solve the issue uh, in the long term, uh, such, that, such that we can restore the water quality to the level uh, that uh, uh, to the healthy uh, conditions. And in recent years, um, there's some significant development regarding the storm water treatment. Um, in addition to the tool that I discussed previously, uh, uh, media filtration uh, is an emerging technology that can be used for storm water treatment. So basically, we can apply some react reactive material 
and to remove some of the contaminants uh, in the storm water. I have two examples here. Uh, this example is at Oklahoma, uh, is a golf course, and uh, Oklahoma uh, State University uh, installed this uh, storm water treatment structure. And these materials are steel slag. Uh, it's a byproduct from a steel making uh, company. And because of because there are many reactive materials are located on the surface of this material, and this material can remove nutrients such as phosphate from generated from the golf course. And this is a site uh, in Prior Lake in Minnesota. Uh, University of uh, Minnesota developed this technology, and they use uh, iron filings, uh, industrial product, and then mix that material with the sand. Uh, so the storm water runoff will enter this treatment zone first, and the treated water will diffuse from the bottom and then enter the lake after the treatment. And based on these two studies, uh, and the uh, and the results showed that uh, this material can be used to remove uh, nutrient specific phosphate uh, being generated from the storm water. So basically, we have some new material and a new tools that can be applied. Uh, as the effective treatment uh, solution for some of the water quality issues uh, for some water runoff. And the material that we have been evaluated, evaluating at SDSU uh, are two steel byproducts. The first one is the recycled steel uh, chips. Uh, for example, uh, when, we produce, when we produce machine tools, uh, tractors or different machine tools, when we cut the steel plate, uh, we could generate a large amount of uh, steel turnings, steel walls, and steel chips. And those steel uh, byproducts are waste material are typically recycled to the steel making company. Um, and uh, because the steel byproduct has high content of iron, and we uh, saw that this material could be potentially used uh, for some water treatment to remove some of the contaminants. And the reason why this material uh, can remove some of the contaminants is because once steel chips are exposed to the air, the, the, uh, the surface will have rust. So basically, we could have iron oxi oxi oxide on the surface, and iron oxide are known material for water treatment. And the other group of uh, uh, recycled steel products that we are evaluating uh, it is steel slag, and this material has been used in other places for some water treatment for phosphate removal. And this figure shows how these uh, byproducts are generated uh, during the uh, steel making process. Uh, the impurity will be discharged as a byproduct, and these are the form of the steel slag. And uh, and this is a, a, this steel slag are good material for the construction purpose. Uh, DOT, a uh, state DOT. Uh, can use this material for road uh, surface and for as a concrete uh, mix. So it has some value uh, for a construction purpose. And from an environmental standpoint, and we found that these materials are very effective uh, for nutrients such as fossil removal uh, for water and wastewater and storm water. And therefore, we have several major objectives for our research. Uh, the first one is that we want to develop a technology that are low maintenance and a low cost that can be applied for uh, some water treatment. And our focus is on E. coli removal because right now uh, we are lacking of the tool uh, for E. coli control in the some water runoff. And the material we are focusing on are steel byproducts, including steel chips and also steel slag. And lastly, uh, we want to determine the long-term performance of uh, uh, a pilot steel filter located in the city of Brookings that we installed uh, several years ago. So these are total of the several material that we evaluated in this uh, in our study. Um, so this is uh, these are the uh, steel uh, slab. Uh, we collect from Newport Corporation in Nebraska. And also this is one of the steel chips uh, that we collect from two locations. Uh, one recycling company, Sioux Falls, 
and the other recycling company in Marta, uh, Minnesota. Uh, we have some local supply uh, for these uh, recy recycled steel chips. And also, uh, we also evaluate some of the limestone and, uh, and zeolite as a natural mineral to compare the efficiency uh, between uh, the recycled material and some of the natural mineral that can be used for water treatment. So this is uh, an overview of some of the lab study that we did. So first of all, we uh, see the material to a good size range, uh, such as one to two millimeter. And also we culture E. coli in our lab and, and, uh, and dilute the E. coli uh, into the uh, concentration uh, for the, our lab study. Uh, and we vary the uh, influence concentration from 10 to 10 to the 4 per milliliter. And this concentration are generally higher than the regulatory limit uh, that's needed because we want to know how the material behave, uh, behave on the high concentration, such as, uh, such as when we apply the material in the field, it, we can guarantee enough capacity uh, for the treatment. And also we look at the temperature impact uh, on the treatment. And we mix the material, uh, material and the equalized solution uh, for two to 24 hours. After that, uh, we measure the equalized concentration uh, at a different times of content. So these are some of the uh, experiment supplies that we use in our lab uh, for equalized absorption ex experiment. Uh, these are the shakers uh, we use to culture the E. coli and also use used for the batch resorption uh, study. And uh, this is the centrifuge. Uh, so these are E. coli culture. Uh, the centrifuge uh, as a, to produce a concentrated stuff. And from there, we dilute to the target concentration uh, for the experiment. And this is the uh, IDEX method. So we measure the E. coli concentration after treatment. And each of the yellow uh, uh, dots indicates the E. coli concentration. And based on the total number of uh, yellow dots and the non-clear uh, dots, and we know the concentration E. coli based on the IDEX uh, standard. So this is a ET certified standard uh, for E. coli analysis. And this uh, figure shows the results from the, our batch absorption study for E. coli removal from different materials. Uh, steel slag, steel chips, a zero light, and a limestone. And for four concentrations, 10, uh, 100, uh, 1,000, and 10, uh, 10 to the 4 uh, per ml. So these are the, the very high concentrated compared to the typical snow water run. And as you can see, uh, for steel chips, Regardless the uh, the initial concentration, uh, we were able to remove uh, somewhere between 94 percent to 90, 96 percent. So basically, the majority of the E. coli were absorbed onto the surface of the steel chips. And for other materials, the second most effective material are steel slag, and the variation was between 20 to 80 percent for high concentration E. coli uh, to 50. Uh, 0.7% uh, uh, for the lower concentration. So we were able to achieve a reasonable removal of steel, steel slag as well. However, for the two natural minerals, uh, zeolite and limestone that are generally available in, in the state, uh, the removal efficiency was not high. Uh, it varied between 10 uh, to 34.4 for zeolite and 25 to 40% for limestone. So basically, based on this result, uh, and we found out that steel chips were the most effective material for E. coli removal. And also steel slag shows some promising potential that can be applied for the uh, stormwater treatment. And generally, zeolite and limestone were generally not effective for the E. coli absorption. And we also evaluated the temperature impact on the two materials that we identified that are most efficient for E. coli removal, uh, steel chip and steel slag. Uh, we evaluated 5, 20, and 30 DVC. And based on this result, uh, we found out that between 20 and 30 DVC, uh, the impact was minor. Uh, both material uh, reached a similar removal uh, between uh, 20 and 30. However, 
uh, when the temperature drops five degrees C, uh, we see a significant reduction uh, in e-prime removal. Uh, but however, on general stormwater condition, we know uh, stormwater is generally typically during the summer uh, time. So on the normal temperatures, we believe uh, steel chips uh, can have worse uh, effective removal for the E. coli. Under certain conditions, early uh, spring, uh, runoff spring, uh, snow melt condition, um, the removal efficiency can be reduced during the early spring runoff condition. And after the success of the lab uh, batch uh, experiment, uh, we, con we constructed the continuously flow reactor to evaluate the E. coli behavior under continuous flow condition uh, because batch study is a static condition, whereas the continuous uh, flow column uh, the experiment is a continu continuous flow condition. And this, this condition can simulate the real runoff uh, uh, condition. Uh, so therefore, in order before the pilot study, uh, we uh, installed this column reactor uh, to evaluate uh, a condition in the lab that's more uh, more simulating the real uh, snow water treatment condition. So this is a uh, uh, influence uh, solution uh, that we will dilute the uh, equi stock into this influence storage tank um, uh, pump. And also the column that has the material that uh, are placed inside. And then we monitor the concentration in the effluent over a duration that can simulate the storm water healer. And this figure shows our result uh, for steel chips um, in different sizes uh, from a very fine particles of uh, 0.5 to 1 millimeter. So this size is very similar to the fine sand, uh, to four to eight milliliter, more like granular size, uh, from a, a fine to a granular size. Uh, and we look at the effluent concentration here. Uh, the result shows the effluent C versus the C zero. So basically, the lower number, the better removal efficiency based on this figure. And based on our Three day continuous flow condition uh, from zero to 72 hours, we observed that the smaller size almost 100% removed the influence concentration uh, 10 to the 6 per ml. So this is an extreme high concentration, and that's needed in order for us to evaluate the treatment capacity of the material. And also, we found that as we increase the particle size, the removal efficiency gradually declines. And at four to eight millimeter, the removal was roughly about um, uh, 55 percent. But it still is a very good removal, consider the extreme high influence concentration. And also another thing we observed that between 12 hours and 72 hours, the removal efficiency was very stable. Uh, that means if we apply this material uh, for a snow event during from several hours to several days, uh, we are able to maintain a stable removal regardless of the duration. So, so this is very important when you apply this material on the real world uh, snow water uh, treatment uh, field. And also we look at the contact time because when we design the field structures, we have to know the size of the structure and to know the contact time uh, between the storm water with the media. Uh, we look at the content from five minutes to 20 minutes. And regardless of, uh, and between the five and the 20 minutes, we observe that uh, for 20 minutes, uh, we are able to achieve almost 100% removal. And when the time reduced to five minutes, uh, we are able to achieve about 90%. Uh, but still, these are all very good removal percentages uh, considered the extreme high influence concentration. So therefore, this material can be used for E. coli removal at the different contact times. So this, this will give us, give us some room uh, in the field design condition uh, to look at a different uh, flow contact for the field to design. And also, uh, we evaluate the material surface uh, before and after the treatment under my microscopic. Uh, so this image shows uh, how the steel chips look like uh, before the experiment. 
and we decide early that uh, once the CO2 is exposed to the air, the oxygen can oxidize the surface to form iron oxide. As you can see, the surface is not smooth. Uh, it's, uh, there are lots of uh, uh, holes and valleys and some of the uh, 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 crystal uh, shaped material. These are iron oxide. Iron oxide. And after uh, after the experiment, uh, after you cry removal, we were able to observe a high density uh, bacterial cell being attached on the surface. So this is the direct evidence uh, and how the material uh, can be used uh, to remove the E. coli from the stormwater runoff. So following the bat lab study, uh, so we want to apply this technology uh, to a real world application. Uh, so therefore we collect uh, additional material from uh, uh, Marshall, Minnesota, and also from uh, uh, Nebraska, uh, two materials, steel slag and also steel chip. And we process uh, the material in the lab to achieve a very good filter size to allow the water to flow through the material. And we work with City of Brookings Engineering Department to identify, uh, to identify a site uh, that we are able to uh, construct a, a field filter. And, and this location is close to uh, the uh, Camelot Intermediate School. So if you have some knowledge about Brookings, uh, so that the site is about at the same, uh, south side of the city of Brookings. And this is a residential uh, stormwater uh, detention pond. And there's a pipe underneath this area. And this pipe will collect the water from the street within this neighborhood. And, and uh, so this is the inlet of this uh, detention pond, and this is the outlet. And during regular time, the pond is dry, and during the storm event, the pond will be uh, flooded, and gradually uh, the storm water will uh, discharge uh, to the downstream uh, system. And this is um, a uh, close, uh, close look of the, uh, our uh, detention pond. And the, uh, the drainage base uh, is about 16.16 acres, so it's a medium sized residential uh, drainage uh, area. And this is how we created this storm uh, uh, field structure. So it's a, a box type open top structure. And uh, the dimension is 18 pipe and six feet uh, length and five feet uh, width. So it's a very um, uh, manageable size that we can do in our lab. And we fill up this structure uh, with the two material that we collected, steel slab and steel chip, and we mix together. And this photo shows how does it look like uh, during a real uh, storm water event. And this figure shows how we uh, install this filter, uh, Abdul and the plate. Uh, we place the filter at the inlet of the detention pond, and uh, our student uh, adds the material uh, that we pre-processed. Uh, and after that, uh, we uh, even mix the two material together such that we have uniform media filtration uh, during the storm treatment. And this photo shows uh, how does it look like during the storm event. So basically the water, uh, the storm water runoff collected from the uh, street, uh, street and the other landscaping uh, will merge into this uh, drainage pipe. And from there, the water will flow through our structure. And uh, during the storm event, uh, we would collect sample here as an inference sample. And also we will collect effluent sample uh, from the exit of the our structure. And we uh, monitor this structure for three consecutive, consecutive years, uh, 2018, uh, 2019, and 2020. Uh, in 2018, uh, we uh, mixed the two material for 70% uh, for steel chip, 30% uh, steel slag. So we had more steel chips, uh, 
that's less in 2018. Uh, in 2019 and 2020, uh, we changed the ratio to 50 to 50. So half of the material is still chip, and the other half is still slag. And also we mentioned the same ratio uh, for the 2019 and the 2020 to look at whether the material aging uh, in the field can, uh, can have some impact on the uh, treatment performance. So this data shows the results for the 2018 uh, storm event. 70% uh, uh, steel chips, 30% steel slag. And we were able to collect uh, four storm events uh, during that uh, summer season. As you can see, uh, the influence concentration of E. coli uh, very uh, sub substantially uh, from uh, somewhere between 100 or to 20,000 uh, uh, 20, per 100 ml. So we have a wide variation uh, in the influent E. coli concentration. And, uh, and we observed that in generally, the effluent concentration of E. coli gradually generally declined compared to the influent. And on average, uh, we are able to remove 52% of the influent E. coli uh, in 2018 uh, for the first year of the in installation. And this data shows 2019, uh, we changed the mix and ratio to 50 to 50%, 50% uh, steel chips and 50% steel slag. And uh, similarly, we observed a different ranges of E. coli uh, in the influent. Uh, from, uh, uh, low concentration uh, to some of the very high numbers. But uh, generally, we observed a uh, 53% reduction uh, in 2019. Uh, again, very similar to the first year's result. So this four figures show the four storm events in 2020. And uh, we did not add any new material in 2020. So we maintained a 50% steel chip and 50% slag, and those material has went through 2019 season. And after one year, we want to know whether the, the filter can still have some good E. coli removal efficiency. And indeed, uh, we observed that uh, even though we did not add any new material, after one year operation, we were able to achieve uh, an average 54%. So very similar to the first year's results. Uh, uh, so basically, we uh, went to me observe some substantial variation in the E. coli, but uh, the filter was able to remove 50% of the influent E. coli. Uh, in addition to E. coli, uh, we also monitor the phosphate concentration in different seasons. Uh, this is the influent phosphate concentration. Uh, the concentration was somewhere between uh, 0 0.12 milligram per liter to about 0 0.8 to 1 milligram per liter. So this is a typical phosphate concentration in storm water event. And these concentrations are high enough to cause eutrophication in surface water body. And we were able to achieve 51% uh, 50, 50, 50, 50 of phosphate removal uh, from, uh, uh, from this storm, uh, for storm event. So basically, Observe that not only E. coli were removed by the filter, uh, phosphate uh, can also be effectively removed simultaneously by the media filtration. So, based on our lab study, batch and column study, combined with the pilot scale filter study at the Cedar Brookings, uh, we have several major conclusions. The first one is that steel chip a very efficient material for E. coli removal, uh, better than slag, limestone, and zero light. And during the pilot study, three-year field study, we observed that uh, steel chip, steel slag filter remove uh, approximately 50% of the E. coli and also 50% of the phosphate. So we are able to remove more uh, contaminant uh, through this simple media filtration. And finally, uh, we conclude that recycled steel products are efficient field material for E. coli phosphate removal that can be potentially applied to real world application for storm water management.
And this, uh, this project was uh, funded by uh, US DOT uh, Mountain uh, Plains Consortium. Uh, it's uh, the total water development district and the day three water development district. And also, Senator Brookings uh, worked with us uh, to provide us a pilot site location for us. Um, and also, we have several uh, great students who work on this project and open their master degree, uh, Guy, Tony, uh, Jason, and Brandon. Um, Guy and Tony are doing PhD study in different universities. And Jason and Brandon are currently working as a consultant engineer uh, in this region. So future work, um, we discussed with a set of uh, Super Bowl uh, calling uh, and Troy regarding whether we can apply this technology to the city. And uh, in October, we visited the several sites together with the city engineers, and we were able to identify several potential sites uh, that could be uh, used for the for a larger scale uh, pilot study. Now we are working uh, with Sioux Falls, and also we are working with the East Dakota Water Development District uh, regard, regarding the funding and the collaboration for this project. Uh, we expect to start this project sometime uh, next spring or summer. So that's our future plan. Uh, we plan to build a larger scale pilot study uh, in the city of Sioux Falls and to monitor the Ukraine removal uh, using steel byproduct. Uh, and the local efficiency uh, regarding the uh, 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 the fuel filter. And that's what I, I have regarding this technology. We have been working for the past several years. Uh, I'm very happy that we are able to apply this uh, university there to a real world application. I'm looking forward to work with the city, Sioux Falls. Hopefully we are able to build even large scale application uh, to uh, uh, to better manage the storm water uh, with, with the city of Sioux Falls. Thank you very much. And any questions? Yes. Okay, the question is whether we manage the metal concentration in the effluent. Is that right? Uh, that's a very good question uh, because when we apply some new technology or new material for environmental treatment, we have to look at the potential environmental impact. Um, and we know that a steel slag has been approved by EPA for construction purposes. So basically steel slag uh, is a, a material that's already approved for environmental applications. And regarding the steel byproduct, uh, we believe the most content uh, is iron. There may be some minor alloys like the nickel and other alloys, but those alloys are much less uh, concentrated than iron. So there is a potential we can leave some uh, uh, iron uh, into the effluent. And we did measure the iron concentration effluent. The concentration was somewhere between 0 0.1 milligram per liter to uh, low milligram per liter level. And based on our uh, observation, we believe that the concentration would not cause a high impact on the downstream water quality. And also, when we mix the iron material with slag, we observe that the slag material was able to retain majority of iron leach from the steel byproduct. So by mixing the two material, we are able to reduce the potential um, iron concentration uh, in the effluent. That's a very good question. That's something that I think we will also monitor uh, for city to force when we put that filter uh, in, into application. Yes. Okay, the question was uh, how we maintain the filter on the field, whether we need backwashing or routine maintenance. Um, so stormwater treatment is very challenging because it's a diffuse nature. Unlike uh, municipal water and wastewater treatment, uh, we have a different uh, mechanic structure. We are able to control uh, the flow, control the air supply, control chlorine disinfection, UV disinfection, and the backwash filter. But for the diffused storm water, we don't have the structure to do that. So therefore, for general diffused storm water treatment, we want to identify those low cost and the low maintenance structure that can be applied in the field with little or no oversee or maintenance. So that's why we look at this steel byproduct. It's a cost effective material. And once those material apply in the field, we do not expect 
a high demand for maintenance. If it does, it defeats the purpose uh, for the different diffuse treatment. Um, and we believe that uh, as long as the field is not clogged, uh, it will continue to maintain the treatment efficiency because during the storm event, E. coli would be attached to the steel slag or steel chip surface. And once the storm event stops, during the dry seasons, the E. coli would die off and we would regain the treatment capacity. So as long as the filter is not clogged, we expect it will last very long time. Certainly some, if it's clogged, we need to move some of the clogging material uh, that may be required. Okay, that's a good question. So the question is, uh, we know that E. coli can die off during dry season. Uh, what about the inorganic phosphate or other inorganic pesticide or herbicide? What about those contaminants? Um, so the contaminants would accumulate uh, in the filter media unless they can be removed by biodegradation. Uh, if bacteria can use that like material, or if the sunlight can destroy some of the uh, pesticide or herbicide. But we expect that phosphate will be permanently attached to filter media. But that's a good thing in my opinion, uh, because if the phosphate is attached on the media over time, we could accumulate those nutrients on the surface. And once we decide that those material is exhausted, we need to add a new material. The waste material can be recycled as a nutrient source. Uh, for example, we can apply those material into landscape or agricultural production to be as a nutrient source. Actually, in our lab, uh, we're trying to back elude the steel chips using uh, some solution. We, we were able to recover more than 80% of the phosphate. Uh, so, so this technology can have the potential not only to remove the phosphate, but also to recover the nutrient that's available for other beneficial purposes. So the question was about the lifetime of the material in the field. Um, so that's something we are still working on because it's a new technology. But based on our study, we did a three-year field study, and especially during 2019 and 2020, we did not change the media. And in 2021, we also, in the past season, we also keep the same material for the third year, I didn't see the result. Uh, but we reduced the steel chip percentage in, in this season. But for three years, we were able to remove 30 to 50% of E. coli. So basically, from our pilot study, we uh, can see at least for several years, so the material can be effective in the field. Um, consider it's a low cost material and it can be potentially recover some nutrient. Uh, if we are able to use this material for three to five years, that's a very good lifespan, uh, in my opinion. Uh, certainly, we need to continue to observe the lifetime. But as I uh, discussed earlier, the removal mechanism for E. coli and phosphate are different. We believe that because of the wet and dry conditions, uh, those materials will have very long-term E. coli removal efficiency. But for phosphate, it's an accumulation process. So over time, as you, as you can think, uh, gradually we would lose the phosphate uh, removal capacity depending on the uh, concentration in the inflant removal percentage. But that's something we need to continue to observe. But from all parts, they at least those material are effective for three or even more years in the field. Uh, the cost for our structure, pilot structure, uh, actually we contract the, the, the steel uh, structure uh, with a, a manufacturer, a local manufacturer. Uh, the structure was $600. And the material was given to us for free. Um, so, and uh, actually the recycle company uh, could get some revenue from that. It's more like point, if I'm not wrong, maybe point two point zero dollars per pound of it's a very cheap material for that. Uh, so give us some very small amount, it doesn't hurt them at all. But if for large applications, uh, we may have to pay certain amount to, to get large amount quantity of material, but the recycling fee is very cheap for the steel uh, chip. And for the steel slag, also it's a cheap material. Uh, and also the sale to the construction company 
at a very low cost. So I don't believe the cost will be a constraint for this technology. I do not know the exact dimension of that pond. Uh, it could be um, 100 feet. So it's not a large pond. It's a, it's a medium, low to medium size residential pond. And during a heavy storm event, we did observe that the pond itself is, a, is a flooded. So our structure was underneath the water uh, during a heavy storm. But we had to wait either the first flush or the water dissipated in order for us to collect the sand. Yes. Okay, the question was uh, regarding the media side, whether it's potential the, the storm water can, can flush the media into the downstream uh, structures. Uh, actually, we, uh, me we measured the iron concentrate in the alkaline. They were typically very low. And also, we observed the soil condition downstream in the pond. We didn't see visible um, the orange color or, or particle. And also, we, uh, if we look at the filter media, and we did not see a much uh, loss of the media. I think one reason being that the media are heavier than uh, that typical uh, light material. So they, they maintain the structure. And also, by mixing the two media, we are able to retain the, most of the steel. And regarding the size of the material, that's very important uh, because if the media size is too fine, we would have very low hydraulic conductivity. In that case, the water won't be able to easily flow through. So therefore, for the flow through structure, we have to focus on those sides that allow the water to be, to be able to pass through the media. So therefore, we look at uh, from, two, uh, from one to two and then all the way to the uh, centimeter range. So in the future, we will work with the city to identify the site and to figure out what's the best size range uh, to allow, not only for the treatment, also to allow the water to flow through uh, the structure. Okay, whether some other water quality parameter could impact uh, the, the efficient of this technology. Uh, indeed, I, I, I didn't show our, uh, of our study. Actually, we look at the pH, pH impact, uh, and also we look at organic impact. Uh, because those are the competitive contaminants that could compete the sites for phosphate for, for, for E. coli. And, uh, we, and uh, we look at the actually at high pH conditions, we have less efficiency uh, because E. coli is negatively charged and OH is negatively charged and steel surface is positively charged. So if we have a lot of negative charged species, they would compete at the other side. And for organic matter, we also observe the competitive resorption. So if we have more organic in the, in the water, the steel surface would absorb more organics and less E. coli. And based on some other studies uh, that the organic could have some impact on the intermediate uh, E. coli removal and the detachment, we found that if you have high uh, organic matter in the storm water, so the organic could flush the E. coli uh, to the downstream that the previous absorbed that had been done in some sand filter or granular active carbon filter. Um, and the E. coli can be washed out if you have high organic concentration. But the, we believe that because we use a strong iron oxide material, so the force between the steel surface and the E. coli are strong enough that could be prevent the wash off by other contaminants during the treatment. That's a very good question. All right, thank you very much uh, for being here today. Thanks a lot.